Hello, my name is David Wishart. I'm a professor with the Departments of Biological Sciences and Computing Science, and I'm happy to give you uh, this lecture on machine learning and infectious diseases. So I'll begin by telling you a little bit about infectious diseases. Um, most of you are probably familiar with them, and uh, those of you who are not, this will just be a brief introduction. So I'm calling them ID for short, infectious diseases. They're caused by pathogenic microbes. So that includes bacteria and viruses, parasites or fungi. Um, so they're basically microscopic organisms and they're quite pervasive. They're everywhere. Uh, they're on your skin, they're in your mouth, uh, they're in your gut. Most of them are not pathogenic. Uh, some of them actually are very helpful, but the pathogenic ones kill about 13 million people a year and more recently, actually more than that. The thing about infectious diseases is, is that they are preventable and mostly treatable. Uh, we can treat them with antibiotics. Um, we can also prevent them through vaccines. We can also prevent or treat them through public health measures, including things like improved water supply and sanitation, monitoring foodborne illnesses, sterilizing things, wearing masks when you're sick and so on. There's a number of examples. Some of you, most of you probably heard of at least a few of these. Probably one of the more famous ones is Ebola, an infectious disease caused by a virus. It's about 95% fatal. There are other diseases such as tuberculosis, which is caused by bacterium, influenza, which is caused by a virus, AIDS or HIV, also caused by a virus, strep throat, that's caused by a bacterium. The common cold is caused by a virus, as are measles. Uh, cholera and botulism are caused by bacteria, malaria by a parasite, uh, diphtheria, bacteria, hepatitis, uh, a virus, meningitis can be both bacterial and viral, polio and rabies uh, are both uh, viral as, as tetanus is bacterial, and then probably the most famous of these is COVID-19. I'm going to be talking a lot about COVID-19 in part because of, uh, I guess, a coincidence of a number of events and also the fact that we've used a lot of machine learning to study COVID-19. And when it comes to managing infectious diseases, um, they can exist in different forms. Some can be quite localized, uh, outbreaks in just a, a few small villages uh, or even just a, a neighborhood block. Uh, some can become an epidemic, which means that you are spreading beyond simply villages to multiple towns and cities and, and states or provinces. Some diseases become endemic, meaning that they're everywhere all the time. You could say that the, the common cold is pretty much endemic. It's everywhere all the time. Um, or things can go out of hand and become a pandemic, which means that the epidemic has evolved and it now has spread beyond, say, a localized region in a country to multiple countries or potentially around the world. And a pandemic is much more dangerous than an endemic uh, situation. A pandemic means many people are dying. So most of these infectious diseases can be prevented or limited. And there's a lot of medical interest uh, from the public health perspective and the research and drug development perspective in terms of tracking outbreaks where and when they're occurring, modeling the spread of infectious diseases over regions, so that's spatial modeling, predicting the levels of infection or death over time, that's temporal modeling, modeling the efficacy of certain interventions from public health perspectives to vaccines and antibiotics, um, and then estimating the total morbidity, mortality, or burden of the disease using sort of limited surveillance because it costs a lot of money to track disease. Yet we also want to know the cost of disease and in terms of not only dollars, but also lives lost. So these are all part of the, the managing of infectious diseases. It's part of how we gauge our response. It's how we try and save lives. Um, and some of these things are uh, based on modeling. So modeling for infectious diseases has been around for a long time. And as far back as the early 1900s, epidemiologists developed uh, these types of equations called the SIR or SEIR models. S stands for susceptible, I stands for infectious, R stands for recovered, and the E in SEIR stands for exposed. 
And see, these are, are coupled differential equations. They're time dependent, and they're looking at the evolution or time dependence on, um, on susceptibility, infectivity, exposure, and recovery. They predict time evolution, and you can see in the lower graph how these things evolve, the number of people who are susceptible um, um, goes from a high level and drops very quickly, the number of people who are infected, which is red, climbs up, and as they recover, the number of people recovered uh, slowly climbs up to essentially max out to 100% of the population. These models depend on parameters, betas and gammas and deltas. But those parameters are really difficult to measure. They're great fudge factors, but they don't really tell you how, say, masking affects um, the susceptibility or infectivity, or how lying in bed affects your recovery. Um, likewise, these time-dependent models are not good for spatial modeling, and they really don't help with the of predicting the effects of public health or pH intervention. But they're great mathematical models, and they're a great way for learning how to do uh, time-dependent modeling. With the advent of computers, people have moved on uh, and have developed agent-based models, or ABMs. Uh, these are actually pretty simple to implement. You can write one in maybe 50 lines of code. Um, they can be quite dynamic, and you can see the, the motion and, and evolution over time and space here. And they simulate the actions and interactions of autonomous agents, sort of like people, or like animals, or like microbes. They've been made popular over the last couple decades with games like SimCity and The Sims, which were very popular in the 90s. Um, they predict not only the spatial evolution, you can also see the temporal evolution. And you can see the graph in the lower left corner of the big picture showing how the uh, number of reds and greens drop and climb and how the number of blues and grays also drop and climb. You can incorporate a lot of complex parameters. You can incorporate geography, so it's like the appearance of rivers or mountains or roads. You can change behavior. Some things move quickly, some things move slowly, some things don't move at all. And that's where you can capture mobility. You can even capture public health measures where you assign certain agents to be wearing masks or to be vaccinated and not. So these are, are really incredibly powerful and useful, but they're really hard to scale. Um, they use a lot of CPUs, lots of RAM. They're hard to run for very long-term predictions. They're more like real-time predictions. So this has made um, both the original SIR models and the ABM models a little difficult to work with. So this is why people have turned to machine learning for understanding, modeling, and managing infectious diseases. And the question is why? Well, some of this actually had to do with the sort of coincident invent in investments into machine learning and medicine, which started in the mid 2015, 2016, 2017 period. Um, so the infrastructure, the know-how for machine learning started becoming available, more and more people are getting into it. And then in 2019, along came COVID-19, which is the biggest pandemic in 100 or more years. What's more is that during the development of the pandemic, um, we were able to use things like the internet and digital monitoring and remote monitoring and sensing and all the tools that have been developed over the last 20 or 30 years to track uh, COVID. So no other infectious disease in history has been tracked so closely as COVID. So the result is that we created huge amounts of data. So this big disease led to big data and you need big data to do machine learning. So it became a perfect opportunity to test the power of machine learning on infectious diseases. So some of you during the last three years might have popped onto some of these um, COVID dashboards. They popped up everywhere. Um, Johns Hopkins had one, Alberta had one, our lab maintained one. Um, many different countries and provinces and states developed them. They're very colorful. They tracked the change in time with heat maps. They had various graphs and rapidly changing numbers as tracking the number of people who had been infected and, and others who had died. These are incredibly informative, but they also had huge amounts of data and data flowing into them and data flowing out of them. So what I'm going to do now is, is show you how using that big data and machine learning allow people to do some interesting things with COVID um, and also extend that to other conditions. 
So I'm going to talk, ex I guess, uh, give you some examples of applications in terms of tracking outbreaks, where and when they're occurring, predicting levels of infection, hospitalization, and mortality. Also modeling the efficacy of interventions with regard to public health and estimating the total morbidity or mortality or burden of a disease uh, with sort of modest surveillance data. And that arose because many countries were not able to track the disease. Some were too poor, some deliberately chose not to do this. So as I say, four different examples over the next uh, 30 minutes here to show you how machine learning can be used. So in terms of tracking outbreaks, um, there's a, a well-known movie from about 20 years ago called Outbreak that starred Dustin Hoffman and Morgan Freeman and Rene Russo uh, about a, an Ebola-like virus that uh, escaped uh, from, a, I guess, a, a monkey colony and ended up in, in, in America. And the worry there was that it was going to spread so fast it would eventually wipe out the entire world. Of course, it just didn't, and, and Dustin saved the world. But they had some really interesting shots from the movie, and I remember watching them showing all kinds of systems for tracking the outbreak and predicting what was going to happen. And perhaps by, inspired by that, um, the Center for Disease Control, or CDC, which is based in Atlanta in the US, has set up an emergency operations center that looks not unlike the one that we saw in Outbreak. Um, it has a giant screen. Everyone has computers. It kind of looks like mission control for NASA. Uh, it works 24-7. It responds to all kinds of things from infectious disease outbreaks, foodborne diseases, and natural disasters. It tracks things in real time. Um, it's probably the most elaborate system anywhere in the world for uh, doing outbreak tracking. However, there are problems with that, and they're laid bare, I guess, with the development of COVID. So having this large center with dozens of people full time um, is expensive, especially if they only see a big incident every five or six months, or maybe every five or six years. Um, it also means that because you're involving people who may only be able to read English language text, um, that they are not aware of other events that may have happened elsewhere and well after other countries have alerted them about the potential or likely impact. So slow alerting has been a problem. And then that also means slow response, because when you're working with people, they need to have meetings and more meetings and consultants and consultations. And so there's lots of red tape that leads to these problems. It also leads to certain biases with leaders and politicians influencing the response or lack of response due to this manual disease tracking. And this again was laid bare with the CDC where people, um, politicians in particular, intervened with the responses or recommended responses they had. So how do we get around that? And in fact, a solution was developed by a company in Toronto called Blue Dot. Um, so Blue Dot um, has developed a machine learning system that takes in information around the world, collects scientific data, public health data, travel data, uh, metadata. Uh, it tracks 300,000 articles a day, from 35,000 sources, not just in English, but in 65 different languages. And it anticipates the spread and anticipates the impact of more than 150 different pathogens and toxins and all kinds of syndromes in real time. It does this through using natural language processing to scan foreign language news reports, uh, animal and plant disease networks, government announcements, and it does this to identify outbreaks. It uses data on air traffic um, control, um, it tracks temperature and climate, population statistics, it knows something about many of the disease types and then combines that with machine learning to predict the spread of pathogens. So even though the CDC with its center sort of identified that COVID as being something of concern in maybe March of 2020, um, this system, the Blue Dot system, identified COVID as a pathogen of concern on December 31st, 2019 and correctly predicted where the next 12 cities would be infected. And that included not only several cities in, in China, obviously Wuhan, where it started, but also Bangkok, Thailand, which was um, the first city outside of China to be infected. So this is a really good uh, example of how machine learning um, beats uh, the manual approaches in terms of uh, doing disease tracking. And it's still used and being used by a number of groups around the world. Let me give you another example of how machine learning can help with the predicting of levels of infection, hospitalization, or mortality over time. 
And this is important when you're trying to anticipate the needs for hospitals or doctors, um, uh, how many beds you might need, um, how much money you need to put into prevention or mitigation uh, or treatment. Now this is uh, an example of a paper uh, that we published particularly about predicting or forecasting COVID mortality using machine learning. This was published in Scientific Reports in 2021. I was involved with it along with Russ Greiner, Mark Lewis, um, Hao Wong, and then the lead author, uh, Coria Ramazi, um, was the one who came up with the idea behind this. So why do you wanna do um, forecasting or prediction? So in the case of COVID, and this is back in 2020, we really didn't know what was gonna happen. Uh, we had wide ranging predictions of how severe it was. Some models, in fact, the first models that came out of the UK predicted hundreds of millions of cases and tens of millions of deaths in the US alone. So that should have and did generate a fair bit of panic. While other models predicted less than 10,000 people would die. Um, some people predicted the pandemic would end by the summer of 2020 or by the 2021. Some people predicted COVID would go on forever. So with all those different predictions and wide ranging estimates of the number of people who would be infected or would die, who do you believe? And what do you use in order to plan for that kind of um, pandemic? So this is why we developed this tool called LAFO PAFO. So it's, it's no laughing matter because it was really to try and predict um, deaths and infections with COVID. LAFO PAFO stands for Last Fold Partitioning Forecaster. This is developed in, in late 2020, and it uses a pretty simple idea of just it's called a K nearest neighbor predictor. So it's taking information from the last five or 10 weeks to predict what's gonna happen over the next five or 10 weeks. So it's a time dependence predictor. It uses more than just what's happened or information that was, you know, the number of deaths or number of infections. It, it included information like the number of COVID tests, number of cases and deaths. It included information about social activity, mobility. It also included weather and weather related covariates because we knew and know that in the summer, COVID tends to drop. And whereas the winter when everyone goes indoors, COVID tends to grow. grow. Uh, we had the data for the US because the US had actually collected much better data than Canada. And we use that to forecast COVID mortality and COVID cases uh, up to 10 weeks or two and a half months out. Now, the, the neat thing about LAFO PAFO is it wasn't a single model. And this is where almost everyone else maybe fumbled a bit. Everyone else is trying to come up with a single model, single equation that would go on and predict forever. So LAFO PAFO produces different prediction models for different time intervals. And then that way is it's, it's able to learn or predict from trends that happened over shorter periods of time. Um, so the, the traditional methods, if they see something going up, they'll predict it will go up forever. Uh, if something flattens out, it predicts, most models will predict it will be flat forever uh, because LAFO PAFO can take um, other pieces of data. It can predict when things go up and down as I'll show. So LAFO PAFO, when it was compared to other COVID models at that time, um, basically clobbered them. It was much, much better. And this is shown here. Uh, here we're plotting um, the predictions and the error for the predictions for the number of COVID deaths in the US and the number of COVID cases. And these are the predictions up to 10 weeks ahead. So that's marked on the X axis. And to do really well, you want to see low numbers. And LAFO PAFO is marked in the dark pink at the bottom, um, which means it's basically the best model. There's some models that um, had a percentage error of you know, 65 or 70%, most hovered around 40 to 50%. And uh, over time, they got progressively worse. LAFO PAFO was sort of the opposite, actually got better over time. Um, and that was true for both the COVID cases and the COVID deaths. So that was impressive. It was helpful. And then the comparisons again were done against some of the top modeling groups in the world uh, who had contributed to this and were adding their information to this, this um, system that was put online. Uh, this is a, another example. We're actually predicting the actual deaths. So we're not just worrying about the percentage error here. We're saying, you know, here's how many people have died or we expect to die. And this was tracking from the beginning of the pandemic when they started to March, May, June, July, August, and September. And then we were tasked to try and predict what was gonna happen 
uh, in October using only the information we had. And you can see the prediction for Lafopafo in orange, and then we compared it against what was actually observed through October and November in blue. And you can see they're almost superimposed, just with a, a variation on the very last time, but that's quite a number of weeks out. So again, I think quite impressive in terms of what this type of model, relatively simple in concept, can do with still using machine learning. The other thing that came out of LAFO-PAFO was its ability to predict not just you know, weekly cases and weekly deaths, it was able to look at the daily variations in uh, COVID cases and COVID deaths. Um, and what's shown is in blue are the reported ones, um, and then what's predicted in orange is LAFO-PAFO. And this, in other words, LAFO-PAFO picked up something really interesting that was observed uh, early on, what there is a periodic or periodicity to reported deaths. Weekends, there are far fewer deaths, and weekdays, there are far more deaths. And this is thought to do partly with reporting, but also to the fact that um, the time course for COVID um, seemed to coincide with the, the week. Um, so it would take about a week for people to get infected, and if it was a severe infection, it would take about a week for them to die. Um, when people went to work, it was when typically when they would get exposed or infected. So you get infections on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then when people stopped going to work, um, they weren't exposed. So there's a period where there's, they're not getting any disease. Um, and then because it would take a week for people who've been exposed um, to develop and eventually die, then that would also explain why we had this drop in deaths uh, during weekends. So the point here is that lafo pafo was able to predict periodicity, um, even though that wasn't part of its model, it wasn't part of the SIR model, um, but it was able to pick up that trend and the fine details. So we had, or I'm giving you examples of machine learning being used to predict levels of infection, to help track outbreaks, but that's only telling us um, what's happening. Uh, we don't have to be helpless. And in fact, the reason why people wanted to do the modeling was to figure out what we needed to do or plan for. And this is how we could have some effective public health interventions. Um, what might work? How might it work? What would be the most effective? What would be the least expensive um, or perhaps the most costly? So as I mentioned before, the SIR and SEI models only tell you what will happen if you do nothing. And you can change your beta and gamma, but that's just like throwing darts in the dark. Um, the public health agencies, government, wanted to know what kinds of interventions would work best. Should we have everyone isolate? Should we just stop everyone showing up to work or close the schools? Should everyone wear masks? Should everyone wash their hands? Should we seal our borders? Should we close down malls? Should we stop sporting events? So the question is, can we modify these kind of primitive 100-year-old SIR models to include intervention data and to include um, some machine learning components? So this led to the development um, in Russ Greiner's lab um, to a program called SIMILAR. So that's an SIR model with machine learning inside. That's where the ML is stuck into SIR. And so this was able to do not only COVID-19 forecasting, um, predicting how much COVID would be present, but it could also incorporate government policies and it would predict the level of infections uh, up to four weeks ahead or four weeks beyond. And this is a plot on the far right, which is looking at Alberta specifically, which was reporting the number of new infections, um, where the blue is what's known. And then the similar model in red uh, pretty much overlaps exactly with that one. There are other models that people had, an orange and a green model, but they're not as good. Um, similar trained on a bunch of data sets. It took data from Canada, it took data from the US. It covered a, a longer period of time than the LAFO PAFO. It went up to May 2021. Um, and it was not only compared to uh, Alberta, it was studied for the different provinces in Canada. It was analyzed to uh, models in the CDC. And in all cases, similar. Um, outperformed all of them, uh, perhaps except one. So again, this is, I think, really impressive. And it, it sort of highlights how policy data, uh, which was tracked or 
compiled from the Oxford policy data uh, would have effects and how certain provinces um, um, had obviously different policies, states in the US had different policies, and those influenced how many people were infected. And so with that, again, you could predict or model what would likely happen. So this would be very, very useful. Now, this model, as I said, was applied primarily to the US and Canada. Could you do this globally? And this led to an effort that was started in November 2020 uh, to apply machine learning for societal good. And this is driven by uh, XPRIZE uh, and it's called the XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge. Some of you may have heard of XPRIZE. XPRIZE has been offered for various things like uh, you know, flying across the English Channel with human powered flight or um, developing a more rapid COVID test or creating a tricorder for measuring human health, uh, the same way that they do in Star Trek. This one um, didn't have as much money as some of the other X prizes, but about half a million dollars was put towards it. And it required teams to build effective data-driven machine learning systems capable of accurately predicting not only COVID-19 infectivity, transmission rates, but also coming up with non-pharmaceutical interventions. So that's you know, masking, isolation, sealing borders. Uh, and mitigation measures that could be shown to minimize infection rates. So they had to make a model, not unlike the one that was done for similar, but to do that all across um, the countries in the world. And then not only that, identify which models, which interventions were most economically effective and which ones were most effective in reducing the disease. So the results have been posted. Uh, I give them the URL at the bottom. Um, you can just type in pandemic response challenge and you can find the website. There are 104 teams competed, including um, a team from U of A. Uh, we actually entered. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the last day before we submitted our code, which was working beautifully, one of the members of the team made a line change, which made everything stop working. So our entry um, didn't make it in, or didn't make it past the gate. Uh, but I think uh, looking at the code again and looking at how, how well similar did, we probably would have been among the top teams. The winning model, as it turned out, was from Valencia, Spain. And um, this is the model they developed for predicting COVID transmission. Uh, the data that they were putting in, they had all kinds of information, heat maps from around the world. They had time course data on infectivity and death rates. And what they used is something called a an LSTM model, or essentially a, a, a model of LSTMs or collection of LSTMs. They had information about the geographic locations. Um, they did a few other tricks to make sure they could come up with some global parameter. And um, overall, that model performed the best. Now, LSTM models turn out to be among the best for predicting time course events. Um, this is an example. So LSTMs are recurrent neural networks or a variation of recurrent neural networks. They're more sophisticated or complex versions of what are called gated recurrent units. Um, they have an ability to forget and remember short-term, long-term memory. So long-term memory, short-term memory. And what's illustrated here is how you have a, a forget gate, which allows you to have the ability to forget things or to have a short-term memory. But then you have an input and output gate, which allow you to retain sort of long-term um, trends. Uh, you have time inputs. You have hidden states, not unlike uh, probabilistic graphical models or HMMs, which are also very good for time modeling. But these are more sophisticated. And you can see examples of how an LSTM can learn from past data and predict outwards. So you can see this in the top diagram, which is shown in uh, red. Um, you can see this in the bottom diagram, uh, where it's had some training data and some training output. And then as you give it more information or as you let it slide along, it's able to predict certain events. So instead of predicting simple periodicity, it can also predict the type of periodicity, whether it's sawtooth or sinusoidal, whether it continuously climbs or stays stable or whether it drops suddenly. So that's the power of an LSTM. Um, as I said, they're, they're more powerful than hidden Markov models or probabilistic graphical models. They're used to recognize patterns over sequences, over time, 
So you can see that in sensor data, you can see it in DNA sequence data, you can see it in animal stock prices, uh, natural language, and most importantly, in epidemic or time course epidemic data. So LSTMs allow it, the model to decide whether to retain previous information in the short term or to discard it. And so because it can do that, both short and long term, uh, it's able to recognize longer sequences, more complex sequences than some of the simpler HMMs. Now, the, after the Valencia team had developed this model for predicting COVID rates in every country around the world and, and how COVID rates respond to different interventions, then they, well, extended the model uh, and extended it so that it could work for other countries for different types of invention, interventions coming from the Oxford monitoring group. So Oxford was tracking how different countries responded and how long they responded. And they would track how long schools were closed, how long workplaces were closed, how long public events were canceled. And so if you could build that into your model, then you could also build in the response, not unlike what's done with the similar model that I talked about before. Um, so if you have a model that predicts using those interventions, then you can play around with saying, well, let's say if we closed everything, how would we do? And how much would that cost? You can see in the model on the left where I've marked not only the uh, cases in, in Spain for COVID, you can see how certain interventions had an effect. So when the number of people in Spain um, were getting clobbered, uh, you can see the sharp rise in, I think, around March 1st, 2020, uh, they closed the schools. And immediately, or within a few weeks, um, rates of COVID infection dropped precipitously. And then, as they dropped to low values, um, Spain opened up again. And then after a couple of months, things started rising and rising with grain. And so uh, around, well, I guess, November, they decided to shut things down a bit, but they didn't do for long. And because they didn't do it long enough, the cases spiked. And then they chose not to do anything. And then so they decided to shut again in January. That lowered it a bit, but not enough. So these are examples where people, politicians in particular, were hesitant about having long-term interventions. Um, and there are examples where school closing seemed to be among the most effective ones. Other ones didn't seem to make so much of a difference. So the winning model that Valencia identified was that um, if you could restrict gatherings and limit uh, international travel, those would be among the most effective ways of reducing COVID. Whereas closing public transport, staying at home, restrictions on movements inside Spain or other countries had an effect, but not that much. So in this way, they were able to give essentially a prescription, but also have learned from observations in other countries what worked and what didn't. And they it also picked up on other things. For instance, you didn't need to wash your hands, whereas masking was more important. And this ran counter to a lot of the advice that we got in early 2020, which was like, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. And that was because of the mistaken belief that COVID spread through contact. It was actually spread through aerosols, through breathing. Um, and so masking became more important and washing hands essentially was useless. So what did we learn from, from this particular exercise with XPRIZE? Uh, First thing to do is never change your code the night before you're submitting it. Uh, second thing is that LSTM models are really useful for modeling infectious diseases and, and predicting what will happen. And that we found out that um, the best non-pharmaceutical interventions were pretty much the ones that we kind of intuitively know. Um, don't have big sporting events with everyone in a giant stadium or an arena, um, restrict travel, especially international travel, or close your borders and wear face coverings. And some countries did this very effectively. Um, Australia, New Zealand did it very, very well until they basically stopped um, um, restrictions on travel. China did it okay as well until this year uh, when they opened it up and then about a million people died. Um, now, what we found as well is that when the Valencia model was allowed to extend beyond just the, the time that the competition was running, uh, it ended up being wildly off. So it wasn't as predictive as we thought. It seemed to work over a relatively short period of time. Um, it's still enough for them to win uh, $250,000 and to get um, lots of publicity. But I think it tells us we still have a way to go in terms of being able to predict um, what happens with uh, pandemics. 
although it did, did tell us that they were pretty good at identifying the most effective methods for um, dealing with a pandemic like COVID. The last thing I'm going to do is talk about how machine learning can help us estimate the, the total burden of disease for a, a, di a big disease like a pandemic or a flu or COVID. And, and this is important because um, we often don't know the, the, the real impact, um, in some cases for several months or years after an outbreak. Um, you know, if people have died, it, it um, may affect um, um, infrastructure, it may affect um, activities, it may uh, alter the, the economy or social structure or social fabric. Um, it may explain why things are broken or it may explain things that we need to fix. Um, it's also helpful just to understand, um, you know, the true impact of an epidemic or pandemic. So the question we asked was how many people really died from COVID over the last three years? Remembering that it's about three years ago today that, that COVID was really identified. And we think that machine la learning may have that an answer. And this is grew from a, an observation we and others had made, which was that different countries were better or worse at reporting COVID deaths. So uh, a country like Egypt for the first year and a half of the pandemic um, reported almost no, no deaths coming from COVID. But we knew from um, funeral records or what they call excess death tracking, so they keep records of everyone who had died, that there were almost 200,000 excess deaths in Egypt over that same time, meaning that a lot of people were dying for reasons apparently unknown. The same thing also was happening in Russia where it seemed like Russia was handling the pandemic remarkably well, whereas in the US, people were dying right and left. But then when Russia started releasing its um, death statistics, just saying you know, how many people had died, there's a huge, huge number of excess deaths. And these are deaths that are over and above what you would normally expect from historical averages. And these historic averages are very steady. They change just by maybe 1%. Um, here are saying massive changes by you know, 20 and 30 percent or 100 percent. So it turned out in Russia, there were you know, three to four times more people in excess deaths than reported. In Egypt, there was 13 times more people. We can see in the U.S., the bright red and the dark red almost overlap uh, exactly. And so the U.S. was pretty good at tracking deaths, but they generally underestimated them. And then you can see some of these other countries like Serbia and Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, grossly underestimated um, the probable number of, of COVID deaths. So it turned out that many countries actually faked their COVID data. Now, in some cases, it was because the countries couldn't keep up with the high death rates and just sort of gave up. Others could track uh, deaths as they could get excess deaths, but they didn't have the ability to identify whether something was a COVID disease or not. They just simply said they died and we don't know why. Some countries initially were underreported just to reduce panic. Some countries in Africa didn't report at all. So it seemed like Africa was COVID free when actually it wasn't. And many countries deliberately underreported to make their leaders look good. And this is especially true in places like Korea, North Korea, Russia, um, places like China, um, Azerbaijan, and so on. What we noticed was that the reporting was a function of how wealthy a country was. So if they had enough resources, they generally tracked it well, how corrupt a government was, what type of government was in place, certain cultural traditions, and then other national features. So if we combine all of those things, which you actually can get data from most anywhere, uh, could we use machine learning and those inputs to correct the faked or missing data? So the idea was to try and collect data on excess deaths and reported COVID deaths for the past two and a half years for as many countries as we could find. And there are about um, 75 to 100 of those that did that. Now remember there's 220 countries in the world, so less than half had that. And we wanted to collect other risk factors. So we wanted to know, um, you know things like how many people had AIDS, how many, what portion of the population was obese, what the population density was, what the level of vaccination. And again, these are numbers you can get for almost every country, um, but they also affect COVID deaths. We also collected statistics on, on countries regarding their pol political and social systems. So the level of corruption, the, the GDP, 
um, reported COVID infection rate. Um, so we wanted then to develop a machine learning model that predicts the true deaths, or if you want the excess deaths, uh, from COVID um, using the reported COVID deaths. Remembering that some countries were accurately doing it and some weren't doing it very well at all. And then we wanted to take that model and then apply it to countries that either had almost no data or very unreliable data, and then try and actually estimate the total number, the true total number of COVID deaths. So the input um, in terms of was, you know, total number of COVID deaths at a given time, and then all these other values or features, which included reported COVID cases, information about the neighboring countries, because some countries uh, tracked and then other countries did nothing. Uh, so you could usually estimate that if, you know, four countries surrounding this one country all had a bad one and then the interior countries said they had no COVID cases, um, that was probably wrong. And then so the influence of the neighbors would have an effect. There's a lag or offset about two weeks between when a person would be infected to when a person might die. Uh, we track the year and the week because um, different um, COVID strains appeared, alpha, beta, gamma, Omicron appeared. Uh, we had to track the year because there are also changes in terms of people's behavior. We looked at information about the people who are over 65. We tracked vaccination levels, diabetes, obesity, HIV rates, the capita GDP, and everything else. All of that was piled into this model, and we tried different um, regression estimators. We tried simple linear one, polynomial regression, support vector machine regression, and an XG boost one. And we measured how well the model would perform looking at absolute error, standard error, percentage error, versus what we knew to be the truth. And this is usually the excess deaths. And this is trained on the countries where we had good, reliable data which is, it's turned out to be about 75 countries. And then we held out about another 15 countries, which were holed out to see how well our model worked. And after we tested, we found that the XG boost model was the best one. And then uh, this is what we found. So what I'm plotting is in blue is the true number of COVID deaths um, versus the number of reported COVID deaths. So the gray line shows the reported deaths in the US, the gray line on the right, reported deaths in Canada. The blue line is what our machine learning model predicted. And the orange line is what the excess deaths were as collected by um, different statistical agencies. And what you can see for the US is that um, the blue line and the red and the orange line are almost uh, perfectly overlapped. So our predictor is doing very good. And what's more, as we already knew, um, the true number of COVID deaths was higher than the reported COVID deaths. So in the case of the US, at the time we'd completed this, there were 828,000 reported deaths, but the actual or predicted based on our model, based on excess deaths, was about 1.3 million. Same thing is true in Canada. Now our model didn't work quite as well. In other words, the orange line and the blue line don't overlap perfectly. Uh, but we gain, we see that Canada underreported. Um, so we only said at the time there are 28 or 29,000 deaths, but the actual number was probably close to 48 or 49,000. You can look at France, and uh, France did a really good job of tracking. We can see that the gray lines, the blue lines, and the orange lines all overlap uh, very closely. There's a slight underreporting. But you can see that our prediction, which is blue, matches very much like the orange, which is what it's supposed to do. And we also did the same thing uh, with Chile. And we found that uh, our model um, tracked very well again with the orange and blue line almost overlapping. And both France and Chile slightly underreported um, the total number of deaths. On the other hand, if you apply this um, to Russia, uh, where the data, data we knew was pretty flaky. Um, we can see that the gray line is very low, um, whereas the blue and orange lines almost perfectly match. And so in the case of Russia, they reported only 298,000 deaths, when in fact it was closer to a million people had died in Russia. And this is up to about six months ago. So many more have died since. So, We've done this for many countries. Um, we're in the process of trying to do it for all 220 countries around the world, including the ones that didn't have very much um, COVID data 
Um, and what we can see is that US and Canada appear undercounted COVID deaths by about 40%. And this is not unique to our study. Other groups have published on this and noticed the same trend. And that largely seems to be due to sort of problems with our tracking and our ability to, to do measurements and public health monitoring. France and Chile, um, even Chile is uh, you know, somewhat less developed than Canada, did better jobs than Canada and certainly much better jobs than the US. They still underestimated, but only about 20%. In the case of Russia, they deliberately underaccounted COVID deaths by at least 300%. And this is entirely due to directives from the Kremlin. And this is the case for a number of countries uh, which are run as dictatorships. So what is the true toll of COVID-19? Um, right now, the current estimate is that between 20 and 25 million people have died from COVID over the last three years. Whereas the number that's officially released that you'll see posted is about 6.1 million. So in other words, COVID is about four times worse than what people have been reporting. And that's just an indication of how much under-reporting has been done around the world by many countries. Um, and I think the data we're getting from our calculations so is that it's, it's probably closer to the 25 million than 20 million. So how does COVID compare to other pandemics? So the worst pandemic of all was Black Death, which happened in the 1300s, and about 150 million people died over about a seven year period. At the end of World War II, there's something called the Spanish flu, and more than 40 million people died. All of us pretty much have been living through the HIV or AIDS pandemic. It started in 1990, still technically ongoing, although treatments have got to the point where uh, mortality is relatively low. But to date, about 33 million people have died from AIDS over the last 25 or 30 years. COVID-19 is ranked uh, number four, and it's between 20 and 25 million, with my own estimate as it's closer to 25 million. So COVID, compared to all the pandemics over the last um, 700 years, is, is probably the worst, um, uh, fourth worst of all. Um, what's more is that if you include AIDS, um, we are living in the two worst pandemics in human history, the AIDS pandemic and the COVID pandemic. Some of you may be old enough to survive the Hong Kong flu, about a million people. Uh, there are other flus that have appeared uh, that have also killed people, but much, much less than what we're seeing with COVID or HIV. So what can we say? COVID has offered a unique and unprecedented opportunity to use modern data surveillance to acquire big data about infectious diseases. Getting that big data has allowed us to use machine learning to use uh, and interpret uh, and, and apply it to tracking infectious diseases, predicting and forecasting infectious diseases, and making or correcting for errors in reporting of infectious diseases. What we've seen is that the machine learning models generally perform better than most, if not all, previous approaches. And some of them actually were spectacularly good. They just kind of blow your socks off. So what it's really saying is that machine learning is here to stay. It's here to stay in terms of understanding infectious diseases, managing infectious diseases, and predicting their outcomes, and also advising us on optimal um, uh, public health measures. So this has changed our, our perspective on disease modeling, and, and certainly, hopefully, it's changed your perspective on the applications of machine learning. So with that, I want to thank uh, many of my colleagues and uh, students and uh, collaborators. Um, I'd like to thank Krishna Kover, who did the work on uh, the total death totals for COVID, predicting for different countries. Um, and then we've had many other contribute to gather the data, because collecting the data was not easy um, and still isn't particularly easy. But without the data, we couldn't do the machine learning. So with that, I want to thank everyone for uh, listening and thank you for your attention.